Um, I'll introduce Dea and then I'll hand over to her and then she'll take over uh, from here. So uh, Dr. Dea Borisli is Assistant Professor of Translation Studies at Carter University. She holds an MA and a PhD in Translation Studies from Cardiff University in the UK. She's interested in translator training and uh, natural translators. And her current research examines the uh, work of trainee and professional translators and translating culture specific items in literary works. He's also working on creating a dictionary of Kuwaiti proverbs and their translation into Spanish, which is called cool the number of articles, including one that uh, is titled Influence of Translator Training on the Perceptions of Translation, as well as on the role of the translator, a comparative study. Before I hand over to, to Dea, I would just like to note a couple of things. So after Khalid has spoken, Dea will open the floor to questions and you can post questions at any time during the webinar by using the Q&A box, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. And you can upvote each other's questions, which will give us an indication about uh, questions popularity. If you prefer to ask your question live, you can do that following the end of, of Khalid's talk. To ask a question live, you will need to use the raise hand feature, which is also at the bottom of your screen. So please do not use the raise hand feature during the talk. Um, this can only be used during the uh, Q&A session. We will be lowering the hand if you raise it during the talk just to minimize uh, disruption. Uh, but after the talk, you're more than welcome to, to raise your hand and we will then unmute you to allow you to ask your question live. So uh, following the talk, there will be a short survey, which all of you are uh, encouraged to take part in. It will help us a great deal in, in terms of planning our future events. So please do feel free to, to fill this one. Uh, on this note, I hand over to uh, Dr. Dea Brisley. Thank you, Dea, and over to you. Thank you, Abdullah. And uh, hello, everyone, and Happy New Year. Uh, I would like to welcome you uh, to this webinar. I am uh, very honored uh, to be moderating uh, this event today, and I'm very delighted to welcome Dr. Khaled Shihari, uh, who will be talking to us today about the role and effectiveness of multilingual health communication in the time of COVID-19, um, and some reflections from Qatar. Uh, after uh, Dr. Khaled's talk, uh, we will, as uh, uh, Abdullah uh, kindly mentioned before, uh, we will open the floor for questioning, uh, for questions, sorry. Uh, you can post your questions and uh, at any point during um, the conversation or the talk, and you may use, again, as Abdullah have said, uh, the function of um, the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, I will introduce uh, Dr. Khaled Shihari. Dr. Khaled Shihari is an assistant professor of translation studies at Qatar University. He holds an MSc and a PhD in translation studies from the University of Manchester uh, in the UK. He is currently researching innovative methods for teaching translation and his current research projects also include work in the areas of language and communication in crisis settings. He is the co-author um, of the Arabic English translator as photographer by Routledge. He has published articles in the interpreter and translator trainer and edited collection. Dr. Khalis' talk today uh, is titled Provision of COVID-19 Information to Non-Arabic Speakers in Qatar, Policies and Practices. Over to you, Dr. Khalid. Hi. Hi, everybody there. Thank you, Dr. Via. Thanks, um, Dr. Abdelhab, for introducing me and introducing this um, event. Uh, let me just start sharing the my, my slides. Okay, I'm, I'm sharing the slides now. I, I'm presenting the first slide. Uh, please, if you cannot see it, let me know. Um, I'm going to talk about policies more today policies that are adopt, adopted by uh, official authorities in Qatar. I will highlight those policies, the, whether there exists any, any mention of translation or any activity related to translation. Um, uh, we need to know whether we, um, or to what extent translation 
uh, is provided by those policies in, in Qatar. And to look also at the practices on social media and to what extent those policies um, are, I mean, uh, achieved through, uh, through the practices of Qatar on social media. So the, the main thing here is more about policies. Um, and when we talk about policies, we refer to any kind of um, regulations, uh, laws, uh, guidelines, any, any of those, I mean, which are uh, published by the government of Qatar and to look at those and relate them also to uh, laws and other uh, similar documents published and issued by international organizations like the United Nations and so on. So the main focus of this talk will be about policies and which policies, I mean, are available there in Qatar and also again, I mean, in, in relation to the, um, to crises in general, crisis management and also in particular to uh, COVID-19. But before that, let's start with um, uh, a background, like a contextual background about what the, the situation in Qatar and the uh, gen more generally about also about the uh, about crisis translation. And crisis translation, a term which uh, started to be coined I mean, recently, I mean the last few years, um, is understood as the translation of written information as defined by International Network on Crisis Translation, Interact. Uh, written information from one linguistic and cultural system to another in the context of a crisis scenario with a view to enabling affected communities and responders to be prepared for crises, improve resilience and reduce the loss of lives. Um, of course, now, I mean, we have an extension to that definition, I mean, of, of crisis translation to include not only, I mean, the written information, but also the oral information, the spoken information, even the sign, uh, those information delivered through sign languages. So it's an ongoing, ongoing process of creating shared meaning among and between groups of communities. And, um, we noticed that and we see, I mean, that with the crises, usually people like migrants and other people, refugees, uh, even expats and working who don't speak the language or the official language of a country, um, face a problem understanding um, any messages uh, given by, by the government or in general by, by, by official authority in that uh, government, especially at crises when there are warnings, when there are like um, messages to increase, I mean, aiming to increase awareness about any particular crisis. Um, um, there's a problem, I mean, of uh, misunderstanding the, the messages or sometimes not even understanding anything of those messages because of uh, the lack of ability to understand the official languages or to speak the official languages of uh, a government or of a country. Uh, this problem is not limited to Qatar, actually. It's, it's more, um, I mean, especially when, when COVID-19 started in uh, like February, March 2020, um, there are many articles being published at that time, around that time, and all talking about the, the difficulty in reaching out to people who don't speak the languages or the official language of a country. And it was actually a big difficulty there, I mean, for, uh, especially for health authorities, how to communicate any updates uh, about COVID-19 or coronavirus at that time when it started. And any, any um, warnings or any information that can help people um, uh, like avoid places, crowded places and to follow up, I mean, any, any measures like uh, social distancing and others. And we can see here, I mean, we have some samples of, I mean, I brought from a uh, number of articles that talked about um, that case, that situation in different countries, uh, like this one, I mean, by, by Lee Jaya, uh, talking about uh, the situation in China, uh, China. And here we see, I mean, that, I mean, Lee Jaya, I mean, found that uh, we have a quotation here by, um, 
yeah, I mean, uh, from from Lejia saying the language, this language choice, which means English or Mandarin, seems to be based on a, the assumption that foreign students and workers in China are able to read and understand either English or Mandarin. However, based on our longitudinal research with migrant students and workers from Bangladesh, Laos, uh, Myanmar, and Vietnam, many foreigners are actually struggling to understand either English or Mandarin because the assumption that they understand it. They assume that students coming to China understand the language of like Mandarin or English. But that's not what they found here, that it's not the, the case. They found that they struggle there to understand English or uh, Mandarin. Some even lack survival linguistic proficiency in these languages. And from Japan, we've got this, this I mean, uh, article also written by Kizu Imawaki. According to the guidelines, people have, we are talking about the, uh, that uh, residents in Japan being advised by authorities to contact health centers when they find any symptoms, when symptoms appear on them, to contact them for advice. But um, Kizu Yamawaki quotes here or states, one wonders if foreign residents who cannot speak fluent Japanese will be able to consult with the health facilities over the phone. It's not only in writing here, even over the phone, which is more, more even difficult for some people, I mean, to speak a language they don't speak or a, a language which is not their mother tongue. So you, you can see, I mean, the situation started to escalate here, I mean, to worsen because, the, the, because of the lack of uh, ability to speak the official language of a country. And uh, from the UK, we've got also about, I mean, the situation there, the, uh, talking about the, I mean, the, the guidelines given to people, to residents in the UK, uh, those um, who don't speak English as their official, as their mother tongue. And even, um, as you know, I mean, the, even migrants being for years in the UK um, are not like, we cannot say that they all speak English fluently or even, even, even a little bit that they can understand, I mean, the main message is given by authorities. Uh, so we've got here, I mean, um, um, uh, Dr. Salman Walker, who is academic GP registrar at the University of Oxford, said there needed to be a better understanding at the beginning of this pandemic, that these messages may not necessarily get through to the grassroots. Referring to the messages issued by uh, health authorities in the UK. So more concerns coming from different parts of the world about the language and the, uh, um, the, um, the importance actually of uh, circulating COVID-19 related content um, among residents in the languages they speak. Um, here to uh, Theresa Krog, wrote, why didn't we have all these resources before? The founder and executive director of the Arkansas Coalition of uh, Marshallese said, there are certain communities that are going to be left out simply because they have a language barrier. And actually we've seen this situation even in, in, in the Gulf countries. I mean, I'm talking about Qatar, but it's Qatar as one of the six countries making the uh, the Gulf uh, Cooperation Council, they have more or less the same situation as we'll see uh, later on. Uh, they have a um, large number of uh, migrants or actually um, workers coming from um, different parts, I mean, of, the, of South Asia in, in particular and Asia, and they, they don't speak English. Many of them don't speak English. And many of them are even literate. I mean, they cannot even, or they don't write or speak, uh, I mean, in, in foreign languages and they don't write even in their own languages. And uh, so that's a big problem here we've seen in Qatar and in the, in the Gulf in general. Um, here uh, again, also, I mean, that we obviously uh, we have this uh, quotation here about again, um, uh, by Theresa Krug, 
some people say Africans can't get the virus. I mean, talking about the rumors, talking about misinformation, given uh, which, which you've seen, especially at the beginning of this uh, pandemic, a lot of information delivered to people through social media and some of the information actually inaccurate and a lot of rumors going on about COVID-19. And telling here some of the rumors that, like for example, Africans can't get the virus or vitamin C can't stop the virus. Yeah, it can help you to fight back, but it's not going to stop the virus. So there are things we have to elaborate. But the question, how to elaborate it? How to deliver that information, that kind of information to people who don't understand the language that we're delivering in? And uh, here, the um, uh, Baal Chaimin, a community navigator at the Displaced based ethnic minorities of Burma Advocacy and Resource Center said, noting that many refugees do not re uh, read and write in any language or do not have access to Wi-Fi or a computer at home or possibly do not even know how to use a computer. Because as, as uh, usually, I mean, like what we've seen there, a lot, a lot of people, I mean, like uh, authorities in, in different countries, I mean, they deliver the messages, I mean, uh, through official channels. And they also, I mean, deliver it through social media, but people don't have access. Not all of them have access to social media, to computers, to mobiles. I mean, here in Qatar, we know people don't have, I mean, they have just uh, still, I mean, they have the Nokia mobiles. I mean, the mobiles that they don't have even social media. Um, now, in, in the Gulf here, I mean, uh, these are the cases we have, uh, like as of 27th September, uh, in Qatar, we can see here that the, the total cases, I mean, the biggest number we've got here, the total case per 1 million was, uh, was Qatar, then we've got Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman, Saudi Arabia, and then UAE. Um, in GCC countries, migrants make up high proportions, as I mentioned before, of the total national populations. In 2019, migrants accounted for 88% of United Arab Emirates, 79% in Qatar, 72% in Kuwait, and 45% in Bahrain. As you can see, large numbers of, uh, of, of, the, of residents in those countries are migrants. They're coming from other places. And we'll see now in that they don't, they don't, I mean, oh, most of those migrants, I mean, or uh, large numbers of them don't speak English or Arabic. The, uh, I mean, Arabic is the official language in Qatar. And also English is assuming I mean, that it's used. Uh, many migrants come from Africa, South Asia, for example, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Nepal. And Southeast Asia, for example, like Indonesia and Philippines. And this is the list of nationalities and their population in Qatar as of 26 August 2019. This is the latest we've got, I mean, published. And you can see here that, I mean, huge numbers we've got in Qatar coming from uh, our non Qataris and they're coming from abroad. Like you can see here, India making 21% of the population in Qatar, 20, almost 22%. Then comes Bangladesh, Nepal, Philippines, Pakistan, and then Sri Lanka. So you can, you, uh, here we, we, need, we need to think about those numbers. I mean, and um, like large numbers, I mean, here of those, I mean, people, I mean, they, uh, don't speak English uh, and they don't speak even, uh, I mean, Arabic, of course. I mean. So they speak only their mother tongue. And that's the question here. I mean, what, what's happening now? What the government did in order to make them aware of what's going on around them? Uh, what efforts are uh, made by, by the authorities in Qatar in order to reach out to those people, to circulate like uh, the important information about uh, COVID-19 and how to help them uh, avoid, uh, like follow the, the standards and the measures like social distancing and other things. Um, what the government here and the authorities did in order to uh, correct the information that they received from social media for those inaccurate information or misinformation they received from 
I mean, from different sources through social media and other 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 channels. Uh, many workers from South Asia are either, according to uh, Ahmed, is one Ahmed in uh, uh, Michael at Durham, uh, sorry, at uh, Qatar University. Many workers from South Asia are either illiterate or semi-literate, and therefore an alternative media that they can understand was needed. It's not just, I mean, the case of they don't speak the language, I mean, the official language, also, I mean, the, the, their educational background, their educational level, I mean, whether they can write and read or not, that's another another question. So this study actually, for I mean, to to write and to carry out this study, which which I'm going to publish a paper on uh, uh, soon, is designed in this way. First, identifying key official crisis management documents like statutes, uh, emergency planning documents, uh, guidelines. Um, um, regulations and so on in Qatar. We first all identify them, then identifying the any related documents such as language related policies, uh, analyzing key stated objectives of those documents, main topics covered, stakeholders mentioned, temporal st uh, status and how the objectives were intended to be realized. Searching for the occurrence of keywords relevant to the topic of translation, like translation, translator, interpretation, interpreter, language, linguistic, and culture, and also accessibility, and also uh, the equivalence in Arabic. Because the documents can be in English or in Arabic, they officially issued like in, in by authorities in English, uh, sorry, in Arabic, and also some of them have uh, English translations. So I search all of those documents in English and in Arabic. Identifying and statistically analyzing practices of five official authorities to examine their use of social media to circulate COVID-19 content among residents of Qatar in their native languages. The study covers February uh, till December 2020. So as I said, I mean, the, uh, the emphasis here is on policies. And that's why, I mean, a lot of analysis will happen to policies and to relate the, I mean, those policies, whether they exist in Qatar, to what extent translation and related terms are mentioned in those policies, are provided in, in written policies um, in order to, to, to communicate with residents in, in Qatar. These are the documents that um, I found available and I um, and got some of them from the internet and some others from some uh, um, like um, authorities. And uh, most of them are in Arabic, I just translated their titles and some of them are already translated or if not most actually of them translated into English. So these are the documents that I looked at and I used for the analysis for my study. As you can see, I mean, the different documents, different um, guidelines, uh, regulations, circulars, um, laws, resolutions, and they are more or less related to crises, to crisis management and to uh, like uh, disaster management. Uh, social media, also, I mean, I got the account, uh, accounts of five authorities in Qatar. I um, collected all of the, their posts, I mean, on, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, um, for those accounts, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Interior, Ministry of Education, Government Communication Office, and COVID-19 Qatar. That's an account belong to an official uh, institution in Qatar, a media communication institution. And uh, this account in particular I mean, was uh, established only after the COVID-19 uh, pandemic started. And for that purpose, I mean, to be like to uh, circulate news about COVID-19, anything, any content related to uh, uh, COVID-19. Now, for policies, when you talk about policies, the, there's a starting point, actually. 
when you talk about policies, we need to look at also at the, the um, any policies um, issued by international authorities inter uh, or international organizations, which Qatar actually is, is a member of, like the United Nations, uh, the World Health Organization and other organizations, which we, we expect, I mean, that Qatar uh, is, is a member of and um, is obliged somehow to, to commit to their, to their guidelines, I mean, to, to follow their guidelines by the virtue of being a member of that organization. Um, so a lot of discussion, I mean, uh, uh, going on, I mean, and I did actually a lot of research on that, I mean, which I don't think, I mean, this is the, uh, or oh, we have time to go through all of that, but I went through um, different documents issued by the United Nations and by the Health, uh, World Health Organization. And I looked at uh, how translation is provided by those documents and or at least the uh, multilingual communication, the, the necessity of reaching out to people of uh, all the members, I mean, the state members, I mean, who don't speak, I mean, the official language of that country. And that was the starting point. I mean, the right to information or as um, given by, I mean, like coined by um, Aubrian and uh, her colleagues, I mean, as you see in the screen in that research, I mean, they call it the right to translation. So that was the starting point for, I mean, for, for the discussion here in my paper that every uh, resident, every human being should have the right to translation if they don't speak the language of the country they live in. And um, so that was the reference I mean, for, my, for uh, my arguments. And since a country is a member of the United Nations and of the World Health Organization and other international organizations, they are expected, I mean, to, to adopt policies and approaches and laws that can conform with those guidelines given by those organizations. So, I mean, according to Aubryan uh, uh, and her, her colleagues and community needs on language access issues are not static. This means in practice that the right to translated information as a part of managing disasters must be a part of living policy and planning documents that guide public agency actions to ensure that the potential fluidity of language requirements in a disaster can be met. Uh, we may say that sometimes, I mean, uh, some people may say, okay, say uh, there's no need for policies because in some countries um, they have policies, but with, with no practices. They just have policies that are on paper, but they don't follow any of those policies. And I mean, in, in some countries, for example, let's say in India, I mean, I've been, told that they have policies actually that um, uh, instruct actually authorities and people work in the field, I mean, to communicate uh, to people to resist in, in their own languages. But that's not really, I mean, uh, what we see uh, in the field. So, but still, I mean, according uh, to many studies, I mean, when you have something in writing, I mean, policies by governments or uh, authorities, that means, you uh, state and you, you announce it, you declare it as a government that we are obliged to do that. And the authors should follow those um, uh, guidelines and they should be held uh, accountable. I mean, if, if those guidelines or those laws, I mean, are not uh, met. And that's why we need to look at, I mean, in this study, um, I'm going to analyze, I mean, uh, and look at the, the, the um, mention of, I mean, to what extent, I mean, uh, um, translation or communication, multilingual communication is stated in, in the policies, in any, any written policies. And as I said before, I mean, policy is a general term. There are many definitions for policies, but I'm, I'm adopting the, the general, the broad sense of policies that which refer to any regulations, written regulations, laws, guidelines uh, that, uh, directs the authority or institutions to act in a certain way. 
Um, there are other studies, actually, there are studies I mean, being carried out on policies, just, I mean, to, uh, to examine the, the uh, and to explore, actually, the policies in some certain countries and to what extent policies there in those countries provide for uh, translation and related activities to help communicating with uh, residents of a particular country who, at the time of crisis. Here we've got, I mean, like um, a study by Aubrey and her colleagues again. In Ireland, the UK, I mean, they did a, a comparative analysis of policies uh, between five countries. And they found in Ireland, the UK, New Zealand, the availability of translation is touched on superficially when they analyze the documents, the policies they collected for their study. They found, yes, I mean, they mentioned translation, but briefly. And they touched on, I mean, superficially informal preparedness or operations documents. In Japan and the US, on the other hand, the availability and accessibility of translated information enjoy higher levels, levels of recognition. Um, in Qatar, I'm going to do it at this part of the world. I mean, just to see, I mean, again, to what extent, I mean, policies um, mention the provision of translation. Uh, as as um, a way, as a method of communicating or managing crisis and communicate, I mean, in which they communicate, need to communicate with residents in that in, in Qatar who, do, who speak neither in Arabic nor English. Um, before I, I, I come to Qatar, let's um, go through the, uh, briefly, I mean, through the um, other states of the Gulf Cooperation Council to see what they have about that. I mean, whether, whether they mention translation, and when I say always translation, I refer to translation and other derivations of translation in English and in Arabic. So translation, transla uh, translating, uh, translator, um, interpreting, and other words, related words. So here uh, we have like in, in Saudi Arabia, for example, uh, I found some actually some, some documents and they are available online. And um, you can see, I mean, that, I mean, that the, 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 the column to the right, the farthest column to the right, it says whether there's a reference to translation or not, whether they mentioned translation in those documents. Of course, I mean, as I said, I mean, all the Gulf countries have uh, large numbers of um, uh, expats who neither speak Arabic nor English. So Saudi Arabia, um, as you can see, I mean, we've got three documents and uh, almost we found, I mean, reference to translation in those, sorry, I don't know where I am now. Yeah. There, there are references to translation. I mean, only in the first one, they don't have reference to translation, but there are references to communicating with residents. They didn't mention translation explicitly in, in that document, the regulations of evacuation and sheltering, but there are references, I mean, to communicating with residents. But in the other documents, they mention translation explicitly in those documents. I mean, like regulations of rules and means of warning in cases of peace and war, and also regulations of the safety and fire protection conditions in hospitals, they mention translation. In, in uh, Bahrain, uh, no references given. I mean, we, I found the, in the Civil Defense Act, there are no references, but there are references to communicating with residents again. Uh, the UAE and the National Emergency Crisis and Disaster Management Authority, no references, but still, I mean, they're, I mean, to translation, but they refer to communicating with residents. And we can say communicating with residents, of course, I mean, we assume that they find or they manage a way, I mean, to communicating with everybody in the country. In Oman, um, I looked at the uh, Civil Defense Act and the civil defense regulations. Uh, we didn't find any particular reference to translation, but there are references to coordinating with the media bodies in the country to promote awareness and methods of prevention. Um, we may consider that as a way of also translating because 
we found another document here, which is a handbook for non-Arabic speakers inside, inside the Sultanate. And actually it's um, this book really, I mean, it's one of the interesting books I found in the Gulf here that's dedicated to, I mean, it's for the authorities and how to communicate with people who don't speak Arabic in Oman and give them like even uh, techniques and regulations and everything, which is really, I mean, uh, well established, I mean, uh, in, that, in that regard. Um, now, what about uh, Qatar, actually the, the topic of our discussion here? Um, I tried in, in different ways, I mean, to find any, any regulations available there, uh, any, any laws, anything. I mean, I, I collected all of those available or I could have reached and uh, just, sorry, I, I don't know where, yeah, I think I'm missing something here. Yeah, the, those, uh, I mentioned the documents some. Yeah, these are the documents that I found from Qatar. These are the documents that I analyzed actually for, in the case of Qatar. As you can see, I mean, we've got uh, about 10 documents. They all related to crisis management, somehow issued by the government in Qatar. And when I looked at those terms, translation related terms in Arabic and English, um, I didn't find anything really, I mean, to any, any direct reference or even indirect referencing to translation or even to communication. Actually, I found in, um, there's a law for Arabic, the use of Arabic. I quote this article, uh, article two from the law, uh, uh, law uh, for protecting uh, Arabic, law for the protection of the Arabic language number seven, 2019, and this is article two. Article two ob uh, obliges minist uh, ministers, government, entities, public corporations, and institutions to use Arabic language in their meetings, discussions, names, programs, publications, and in their audiovisual or written advertisements. So there's a law actually to protect Arabic, which, which is considered to be, I mean, something good in the, in, in the country. I mean, because there are a lot of, um, uh, migrants there and they, they're fearful, I mean, the loss of our uh, problem in mean, that Arabic is uh, at some point they want to protect it, I mean, as the official language of the government. Um, the uh, executive regulations for the environment protection law, that's another, another document I found here that, um, so in, uh, in the law for the protection of Arabic, it's clearly mentioned that Arabic should be used in all the cases. There, there are exceptions, but none of them related to, uh, to crises or anything like that. Um, but I found in the executive regulations for the environment protection law, something can be, I mean, related somehow to communication at the time of crisis. Uh, it says determining the method of informing citizens about the disaster, its developments, and the means of dealing with its effects. Again, here it's there's a reference to communication with citizens, and they mean by citizens actually everybody in the in the country, uh, like in other documents, it's clear. But and they mention about informing people, communicating with them, but still, I mean, they didn't say anything about translation or how to deal with the, with the people who, who don't speak uh, uh, Arabic. Um, again, referring to the uh, to uh, international organizations, uh, there's a Sindai uh, Framework Data Readiness Review report in, about Qatar. And here we've got indicators, questions uh, given, like, like a survey get, uh, sent to the authorities in Qatar to fill out. And it's interesting to see how the authorities, that was in 2017, how ready, how prepared the authorities are uh, to, to, uh, like, to face crises. And look at the answers they sent to, uh, to the United Nations. Are all people in areas prone to major hazards covered by early warning information? The answer was no. These are the answers given by the authorities in Qatar and they're available online anyway. Uh, when do you plan to cover all uh, people in areas prone to major hazards by early warning information? 
within Qatar National Vision uh, 2030, which is clear actually. I mean, 2030. I mean, that's the, the they have strategy. I mean, to uh, to develop the country, and so it's a big strategy. But, uh, and they plan it for 2030. I mean, to end. Um, do local governments in your country have plans to act on early warnings now? Uh, again, 2030, is risk information assessment accessible, understandable, and usable by the people? Yes. Is risk information and assessment available to people at national and local level? No. So you can see, I mean, it's, uh, they are aware here in the government, they are aware that they still have uh, like difficulty in reaching everybody. They still have problem with policies because these questions referring actually to their policies, to re any written policies that uh, cater for differences in, in language. I mean, the uh, language is spoken by the people in Qatar. And that's confirmed actually by uh, the Secretary of the Supreme Committee for Crisis Management. There's a Supreme Committee for Crisis Management. Actually, it was established, I think, uh, uh, sorry, um, I'm not sure if it's uh, just for COVID-19, but it seems that they're working heavily on, the, on this crisis. Anyway, the Secretary of the Supreme Committee for Crisis Management in Qatar um, said, according to the Gulf Times, uh, stated that translation is an important tool for communication and that Qatar is now in their need for translation services. And he said, Qatar had already committed to reforming these laws and regulations and its uh, 2030 vision. I remember he was asked about policies in particular in a seminar that we did together, and he replied with that. He said that Qatar had already committed to reforming these laws and regulations. So Qatar is working on that, is working on regulations and laws, and is working on uh, providing for translation communication uh, services in their policies. The social media, as I said, I mean, it just quickly, I mean, to go through social media, as I said, I mean, the emphasis was more on policies. Social media just used here as an indicator of the practices uh, that, uh, for, by Qatar. And I checked, I mean, all of those, I mean, I, as I said, I mean, collected posts uh, for all of those five um, authorities uh, through Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And we found uh, interesting results really, I mean, if we compare, I mean, first of all, we need to know that Facebook is, is the highest, I mean, in, in, in use by people in Qatar, uh, almost 2.5 uh, million. Uh, then comes WhatsApp, uh, sorry, Twitter, and then Instagram. But what we've seen here that Facebook is the lowest actually used by those authorities. As you can see here, Twitter is used, I mean, uh, in, the, in that table, you see, I mean, uh, the, the row in red, that's the followers, number of followers. As you can see, I mean, uh, in, in, um, and those, I mean, in gray, those are the posts. I mean, the number of posts or tweets or videos. I mean, that was up to uh, September, the results here. We just wanted to have a quick look, I mean, on uh, the figures here, but I will, uh, I will uh, highlight it more in Twitter. I, yeah, just, I mean, that, so the first post about the pandemic was by the Ministry of Health on YouTube on 29th January. Um, so you can see, I mean, they started in February, March, they started posting about COVID-19. So the first case was found on 29th February. And these are the languages which are used by authorities, uh, 13 languages. Yeah. And here we've got uh, Ministry of Health. I, I mean, I just selected now, I mean, for this presentation, Twitter. Um, you can see, I mean, the, um, the post they made, I mean, in March and August. In March, Ministry of Health did 183 posts. Well, in August, 165. So there's like a decrease in numbers here of the posts they do. And the la even in the languages, I mean, in the languages, they started with eight languages in March, but in August, they, uh, they publish their, uh, or they, uh, yeah, they tweet in four languages only. On YouTube, again, I mean, uh, yeah, 
We have only, I mean, 58 in March. And those are the languages used by the Ministry of Health. They started with those languages. But in, in uh, August, only four languages. So you can see, I mean, they're, they're like, instead of going up, they went down. I mean, in terms of uh, the number of languages they uh, publish in. And here by Ministry of Education, again, you can see the languages and numbers. Again, they went down from March 32 post to August 12th only. That's on Twitter, only in English and Arabic. Government Communication Office. Again, limited number of posts there made, I mean, tweets, and only English and Arabic. No other languages used here. Ministry of Interior. They have their own, like they have Arabic version, they have English version on Twitter. And you can see only in May, they used uh, some languages. I mean, like uh, they used 11 languages. That's in May only for some reason. I mean, it was only in May. And that's COVID-19 Qatar. They made in September 343 post and um, six languages. And they stopped actually uh, publishing anything on social media in July for some reason. I mean, it's still not clear why. I think, I mean, in, uh, and there are other efforts actually. Uh, Ahmed and um, Hillman did a study, I mean, on the situation in Qatar. Um, and they found actually there are other efforts. Probably that will, uh, will interpret the why, I mean, um, we have less numbers of uh, posts and tweets and things like that made by the government towards the, I mean, later, at later stadium of the, of the pandemic in other languages. I think because there are other efforts, I mean, they found that those social media are probably not really uh, effectively working. And that's uh, Ahmed and Hillman found that they used other channels, I mean, other uh, ways, I mean, to reach uh, out to residents who speak, who, who don't speak Arabic. They use like socially prominent figures, like uh, religious scholars and other people in the communities in Qatar. They coordinated, I mean, the government coordinated with community radio station, like uh, speaking Hindi, Nepali, Urdu, Malayalam, and Tagalog. They also use social media influencers. But in this study, it's really interesting study, and they covered uh, really uh, a lot of uh, issues here related to the, to the situation in Qatar. But still not clear to me what kind of partnership the government made with those people? I mean, is it something written? Is it something like, like kind of agreements uh, signed between them? And the other question, I mean, the quality of the, the work um, produced by these people, are there any uh, measures, standards, I mean, to, to evaluate the quality of, of, the, of the language they use, the quality of the content, the if they are translated directly from texts given by the government, uh, do they evaluate, I mean, do, do they assess the, the accuracy of translation? Um, do they measure the, the responses from the people, I mean, from those communities to, uh, to posts and tweets and, and given by these people, I mean, by the figure, these prominent figures or by imams or religious uh, scholars or by the radios? There's still questions which have not been answered in uh, Ahmed and Hillman's article. Um, I'm not sure also, I mean, uh, probably we need further research and by other researchers, I mean, to look into those issues. Uh, we need to really, I mean, to go into those communities in, in Qatar and to go in, in, in depth and see how they work, I mean, with those, with those messages and how they produce them. And, um, do they have professional translators? Uh, are there any, any professional editors who edit and proofread their, their texts? And so, yeah, there are questions I mean, we need to go through, really. I mean, there are questions still left, I mean, for more research. And these are my final remarks that I, um, they're like preliminary, uh, preliminary remarks still. I mean, like provision of translation is not clearly mentioned in crisis management policies in Qatar. And although official authorities started posting and tweeting in various languages, 
they have recently reduced languages to English and Arabic. And probably what we've seen in, in Ahmed and Halman's study can, can explain some part of the, of the reason for that. I mean, that they found other effective methods, I mean, to, to reach out to people. Um, official authorities' presence does not match the users of social media in Qatar. We, we've seen that they, they, they use Twitter more than Facebook, though more people using Facebook here in Qatar, according to statistics. Um, new media such as TikTok need to be considered by official authorities in Qatar, especially when, when uh, uh, communicating with people, when, when they wanted to, to reach out to, uh, to teenagers and people. I mean, that we know that it's, this is going to be like one of the most influential uh, uh, social media in the near future, if not now even. And the government may need to revisit the efficiency of their posts and tweets on social media. So, yeah, that's the end of uh, my talk. And thank you very much for um, listening to me and attending my talk tonight. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Khalid, uh, for this uh, insightful and informative talk. It has been quite uh, interesting. So um, we will be moving to the questions now. Um, if the attendees uh, would like to share their questions. Uh, yes, uh, go ahead, uh, Mr. Uh, Mohammed. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the organizers uh, of this uh, webinar and I would like to thank Dr. Khalid for this uh, informative uh, presentation about the situation in Qatar. Uh, um, it's not a, a question, but I have some, uh, some remarks here. Uh, I don't know. Uh, 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 whether Qatar is prepared for uh, for the World Cup, uh, Dr. Khaled, you know that uh, in 2020, uh, 2022, uh, there, there will be a huge uh, or a big event, which is the World Cup uh, in Qatar. So are they ready for, 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 for tackling these issues about communicating uh, uh, bet uh, between between uh, between people, you know, the different people, different national nationalities from around the world will will visit Qatar if if uh, if the pandemic uh, disappeared. You know, this is my uh, first uh, question. The second one, uh, I was thinking that the situation in Saudi Arabia uh, is better in in terms of the. Uh, communicating with different languages because you know uh, uh, Saudi Arabia is used to to uh, to there are millions of people used to visit Saudi Arabia in Hajj Mawsim uh, so i this is another uh, another another thought so uh, the third point is about um, uh, the radios and uh, and communicating with people through through local radios. I think it's not only the residents um, want to know about the, the the pandemic and the situation, but their families abroad. So they need to see Twitter or Facebook to uh, to check the situation as well. Th that's it. Yeah. Shall I just answer, uh, Dr. Uh, yes, please, go yeah, ahead. Uh, Mohammed, thanks for your questions. Yeah, um, for World Cup, um, I'm sure Qatar is working, I mean, hard, I mean, and using all, uh, all the possible ways and all the facilities, I mean, to provide translation for all the uh, visitors expected to come, I mean, to Qatar. Actually, even in uh, this pandemic, I mean, the COVID-19 pandemic, they worked, I mean, they did a fantastic job, really. I mean, if you see, I mean, Qatar, now they're controlling it in, in 
a much, much better way than other even neighboring countries, uh, from my experience and to my knowledge, from what I see in the news. The point here, what I, I noticed in my study is just the policies. I mean, I mean that's the main concern here. Uh, pra uh, Practice-wise, um, I mean, they're doing a fantastic job and uh, they're reaching out to people. Although still, I mean, as I mentioned in my study, there isn't like um, um, clearly and explicitly like written measures or. Uh, how to assess and to evaluate the content and the quality of those messages that are delivered to people who don't speak Arabic here. But uh, they reached out to people through radios and through other efforts, as mentioned by um, Ahmed and Halman in their study. Uh, the main concern here, to what extent that provision of um, communication or of translation uh, explicitly written and referenced to in policies, in written policies and regulations, because if it's not in policies and regulations, that may change. I mean, according, if people change in, in the uh, management of the, I mean, of, uh, of institutions, I think probably they will think, okay, we don't do that because there's nothing written. That's the only point here. And um, uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you mean about Saudi Arabia because they have, uh, of course, I mean, experience for years to deal with millions of people coming to Hajj, uh, speaking different languages. So of course, I mean, they they should have, uh, I think, I mean, experienced uh, it in, in a better way than than any other country. And um, and yeah, for for radios. I agree with you. I mean, for radios, I mean, people probably need to know even from abroad, I mean, what's happening here. But the government is not really, I mean, we uh, we talk about the government and it's what, what the government does for the residents in Qatar. And uh, as I said, and also Ahmed and Halman's found their study that uh, Facebook also used somehow, but not by the government itself, but by other, I mean, Probably in community figures and things. I mean that they reach out to people. So yeah, I mean, and Facebook is, is more influential than Twitter. I mean, according to statistics in Qatar. Thank All right. You. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Khaled. Uh, the next question we have, Mr. Anter here. Um, please go ahead. Mr. Anter. Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me? Yes. Please okay. Go ahead. First of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Anter Fouad, a PhD candidate in UM Malaysia. Thanks again to Dr. Khaled. I have been honored to follow you again on the same topic with more insights about the job of translation and translators in crisis. Having said so, the points you have touched upon, I believe, are international. Translation is the last or maybe least thing to work on by professionals. If you take America, for example, let's talk about solutions. English is not the national language, and every big organization shall, shall by law, use a language line to communicate with clients and customers. Do you think this way of handling communication can be used in Qatar before a person gets COVID during his illness period or post-treatment period? I mean, in Qatar, uh, they have laws here actually to protect Arabic, as I mentioned before. And uh, the official language is Arabic. But I think, yeah, I mean, they can find, I mean, a solution, I mean, here, that problem I mean, to, 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 to communicate, I mean, those who don't speak Arabic, I mean, uh, I mean more individually, like in terms of the communities themselves. And, uh, but I don't think they can do anything about regulations because Qatar is a member of the GCC as well. And uh, uh, the whole GCC, I mean, have their own, they, they have regulations and laws, I mean, that aim to protect Arabic as the official language and the use of Arabic. So still Arabic is, um, is the official language, unlike probably you mentioned the US that it's not official language. I didn't know that really, I mean, but uh, so um, we cannot have that case here in Qatar. We have an official language, but they need to find a way how to communicate with uh, with residents in their own languages. Can I clarify my question? Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah please. Okay. Uh, let's let's think about okay, New York City. New York City has a line, 
and uh, they try to talk to the people and people of course speak different languages. They have this service called Language Line. They offer over 200 languages. So if you need to talk to any person from a different nationality who speaks a different language, you just try, I mean, to call this company and they will provide you with a translator. So my point is that, okay, do you think that in Qatar, maybe in the future, I'm not talking about now because I know they don't have it, maybe in the future they will develop such a system and they will try to reach out to, uh, let's say, more people. They have actually, they do here in Qatar, something similar to that. They have a service, I mean, a system that uh, anybody who, I mean, they have it in different languages, I'm not sure how many languages, but they have it uh, by phone, you can uh, call a number and you can choose the language. I mean, uh, from the beginning, you can choose the language and uh, then they will reply in your own language. They have it also on WhatsApp. I mean, they send messages from the beginning of uh, COVID-19, actually, uh, even from the beginning of Corona. They uh, circulated a number on WhatsApp. Everyone will go to WhatsApp the first time they get into that number, they choose the language, their language. Then the government will, will send messages in the language that the, uh, the, uh, that person chosen. And um, I think they have some efforts like that. And that, that's to my knowledge, I mean, that's what I noticed myself. So they have a system to do that. I mean, to communicate in the people's languages. How many languages? Not sure really. I mean, because as even in my data, I mean, they, it's not like something will, will, will establish, I mean, how many languages to, to communicate with. But I assume they have something to, similar to what you mentioned. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we will move on now to Dr. Ali Idrisi. Um, please go ahead, Dr. Ali. Dr. Ali, are you with us? Can you hear me now? Yes, please go ahead. Hey. I was saying thank you, uh, Dr. Dia. Thank you, Dr. Khalid. Uh, I apologize for, for that. Uh, um, Khalid, um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm a little bit uh, um, confused. Maybe confused is a big word, but I, I need some clarification uh, regarding uh, something that you said at the very last, uh, on the very last slide, uh, which is that Qatar might need to revisit the efficiency of uh, their... Um, policies regarding translation. Uh, my, my, my question is, how do you assess the efficiency of what has happened? I mean, if you look at the way the, 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 the crisis management unit handled the, the, the pandemic uh, in terms of, you know, communication, I think it, they, they, they fared quite uh, well in a sense. I mean, everybody got the information. Um, uh, but again, this is an empirical question. I don't know how many people got the question, uh, got, got the information. But how did you? Why did you say that there needs to be? Uh, there is a problem with the efficiency or the efficacy of of the way uh, this was handled, uh, translation-wise. The other uh, question or comment I would like to make is that I think there is maybe uh, we need to separate two issues here. The one is is the issue of language policies or the language policy. I mean, Qatar is an Arab country and they have become very clear about it recently. So Arabic is the official language. Now, of course, if there is, uh, and given the fact that there are speakers of other languages here, expats who speak other languages, uh, there, there might be, there should be probably, and there will be in the future, uh, some uh, something that would be uh, integrated into the policies, just like in the US. I mean, your colleague mentioned what's happening in the US. Of course, uh, if you need interpreting services when you are in the US or in, 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 in other countries in, in the West, uh, you, you are likely to get interpreting services in your language when it comes to uh, uh, health or uh, legal issues or, or, or the like. Um, uh, so, yeah, and... and uh, so, uh, and just to, to mention that there was a census, uh, 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 there is a census going on uh, 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 these days. And uh, I had to do one and the guy didn't ask any question about my language. So probably the, 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 the government doesn't even know how, how many languages are there and, 
and the proportion of the speakers of those languages. Uh, so they're just, just uh, you know, it's just a, an interesting uh, note to add. But my main question is about the efficiency. Why did you say that uh, they need to revisit the efficiency? How did you measure? Uh, how did you know that, that, that this has been inefficient in a way? Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Thanks, Ali, for attending my lecture first. And uh, interesting questions, actually. The, the first one about efficiency, when I, when I mentioned about efficiency, actually there's there are a lot of data that I collected and I didn't present them all about social media. And here what I mentioned about, what I meant by efficiency, the responses that we got to those tweets and posts uh, made by the government on social media. So um, I went statistically through those, I mean, uh, posts and tweets and I, like um, calculated those likes by people, dislikes, retweets, uh, all the uh, impression um, statistics about people. Mm -hmm. And so we, we found, I found that um, the, uh, the responses that we got from, from uh, people, I mean, who read, those, uh, who read those or received those posts and tweets, not really as expected by, by um, or as, as the statics say about the interaction of people with those social media and uh, not really matching the populations that we have in Qatar. Um, that's, that's one thing. I mean, that there, there's a problem here. Probably we found that uh, there's a mismatching between populations we have in Qatar and the number of uh, interactions those posts and tweets uh, received from people. And, um, and also, I mean, what I mean by revisiting also here, just looking at the, uh, also looking at the policies that the Qatar doesn't have, like at least to the, uh, and the data that we, uh, I collected, I mean, there's no like mentioning of any provision of communication or translation as a way of uh, uh, communicating with, uh, with the residents who don't speak Arabic. But uh, the efficiency came just from the result that we received from the analysis of the posts made by the government. And that's also confirmed also in, in uh, Ahmed and Halman's study that there's still, I mean, uh, uh, some issues about communicating with residents. So probably that what, what we, uh, we need, I mean, they probably recommend that the government need to go and think about again. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Ali, and thank you, Dr. Khaled. Uh, one more question here. Um, if most immigrants use Facebook and the government is using Twitter in the main, how effective are the policies drawn by the Qatari government in combating COVID on the ground? Um, we got this question by email. Yeah, that's, uh, that's another, uh, another point. I mean, that probably this will just, again, um, add to my answer to, uh, to Ali about the efficiency. I mean, that it's something clear from here that, that people use Facebook more, but the government use Twitter more. Mm -hmm. So that's again, another indicator that there's a need actually for the government to look at the, the channels they use in communicating with people. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, we also have another question from Mr. Bender. Um, he's asking Dr. Khaled, how do you collect data from social media, especially Twitter? And if you have any recommendations, if someone wants to replicate this study in other countries using social media data? There are, there are ways actually, I know this question uh, given most, I mean, all the times when we li listen to people talk about social media and collecting data, because there are different ways to collect data there. The point here, the Twitter in particular, that um, you cannot collect all the data manually if you go I mean, back like three or four months sometimes. I mean, they, they are archived somehow and then you need um, API tools, I mean, that in order to collect even all tweets. Uh, what I did, I mean, actually we started very early, I mean, to collect uh, the kind of data from the beginning. And uh, there are people, I mean, we, we did it manually because the API didn't work for, for my study. So we collected all the data from the beginning of it for those three accounts from the beginning manually, just to make sure that we collect everything and we don't need, I mean, because if you collect it through API or any other tools, you need to do a lot of cleaning stuff, I mean, after that. But we tried to do it from the beginning. I mean, from the, when started COVID-19, we collected everything. We hired people, I mean, to collect everything from the beginning. 
and uh, on all all the accounts facebook twitter instagram and that's why we uh, we are sure that we've got i mean the data we have they are accurate i mean they, there's no need for even to do any cleaning stuff in it i mean because we know that technology is not involved in collecting that data and uh, yeah i did it manually but some people do it through api using some certain like codes and things like that and there are also some uh, agents i mean you can use third party agents that can collect the data for you from twitter in particular all right um another question dr khalid do you think we may use recent copra yeah i mean if um, if the if the copra i mean that are available why not it depends on the approach that you're going to to go through i mean to to carry out your study mm -hmm. all right um and i well, sorry uh, dr yeah just um adding to uh bender my uh, reply to bender yes i mean this study can be carried out in other countries if if uh, i mean using the same more or less same methodology or thing i mean they, if they wanted to study the case and the situation in that particular country why not um, there are researchers now, colleagues working, I mean, on, on the Gulf, you know, the whole Gulf uh, as, as a council, I mean, as a group of countries. All right. Thank you, Dr. Khaled, and thank you to everyone uh, for these uh, questions. Um, so I would like to uh, conclude, as it seems that... Um, We've already taken enough of Dr. Khaled's time. So I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. And a sincere thank you to you, Dr. Khaled, uh, for this insightful, informative talk uh, on the importance of um, in including and implementing uh, translation policies um, by the governments uh, to deal with crises. And finally, I would like to thank Cardiff University and uh, Andrew Hub. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, to be moderating this uh, talk. Over to you, Abdul Rahab. Well, it's no problem at all. I, I actually have a question, if you don't mind, dear, and, and Khaled as sure, well. Yeah. So, so Khaled, is, it's more about the, the impact of, of this type of research on, on policy process. So are there ways to communicate the findings of this, of this research to the Qatari government? How receptive are they? So can, can this type of research, not just the one done by yourself, but you've mentioned other colleagues that are working in this area as well. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Can it change things on, on how the Qatari government kind of communicate uh, to the immigrants and, and, and uh, in terms of also changing the multilingual communication policy? Yeah, um, the Qatari government, by the way, I mean, it's working even before, I mean, uh, before the COVID-19, working on uh, reforming their laws and regulations. I mean, and that was the secretary, secretary of the crisis management uh, committee, I mean, uh, stated in a couple of times. And uh, my colleagues, um, Ahmed and Harman also, I mean, they already been um, like, they, they made some interviews and radios about the, the study, the, uh, the, um, they and myself also contributed to a seminar, I mean, attended by some, some of the authorities in that seminar and workshop about the, this topic. And so there's some kind of communication now between us as researchers and the government, I mean, some authorities in the government, and we found them welcoming really, I mean, to, I mean, to work on those recommendations. And we found even, even in that one of the seminars, I mean, that attended by, um, by the secretary of the of the committee, I mean that I mentioned just before, uh, the they they've been asked about this, I mean about the laws and regulations and to what extent they need they can provide for translation communication those regulations and he just welcomed that idea and he said they are working on it and uh, they admitted that there are still I mean weaknesses but they are working on it and they have the intention to reform things to the best. So I think I mean there will be a. a um, a, a clear impact on, on the policies in the near future. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Khaled, for a very interesting talk, but also uh, thank you very much to, to Dea for moderating the talk. So um, a very big round of virtual applause to, to both of you. And to all our attendees, well, thank you very much for, for attending and joining us today. And please do join us um, in our upcoming talks. Stay safe, everyone, and see you again soon in one or more of our talks. Thank, Thank you. you.